I know we're right at two o'clock, but we're watching the participant number climb quickly. So we'll wait a couple more minutes as people filter in and then we'll get started. Thank you. For those of you just joining, we're going to wait about another minute as we watch the numbers climb to make sure we get most everybody on before we get started. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to get us kicked off here, and I know people will still be joining us. So luckily this will be taped, so anything that they might miss, they can go back to see after we get it posted up on the website, hopefully within 24 hours. So welcome to everyone who's here with us for the PPP guidance for the self-employed in partnerships. I would assume you guys have been anxiously awaiting this just as we have. So after that guidance came out yesterday, we got this presentation put together for each and every one of you. On behalf of the partners here at Boyum Berenshire, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out of your day to join us for this presentation. And with that, I'd like to introduce, it'll be Chris Wittick and myself will be the presenters. And then I'm going to kick it over to Nick Swedberg now to give you a few housekeeping items. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, so again, welcome everybody. Thanks for filtering in and getting here on time. We have a somewhat tight agenda, but we should be perfect on time to get through all of it. Really quick, all I need to cover is if you look at the very bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Uh, there's already a few people asking questions, so good work. I'm glad you already know how to do that. The big thing I would ask of you is if you could take a quick scan and look at the questions that are already there. I know a lot of these are going to be very similar uh, since most of us are kind of in the same boat. So please, if you could just take a quick look and see if your question's already there. And then there's a thumbs up button on that question where if you press that, it'll start boosting that question to the top. And then there's a much better chance that we'll get to that. Uh, these, uh, the question tab can get very, very large in some of these bigger webinars. So I don't wanna lose any question that a lot of people have. So using the thumbs up and uh, somebody's already done a thumbs up, thank you, is gonna be fantastic. Um, and I'm already done. So I'm gonna pass it right back over to Stacy to kick us off. All right, thanks, Nick. So you'll get to see as we move through this, our, our attire is all a little different. I'm in the yay, it's April 15th, fun shirt and necklace, and then you'll see Nick and Chris were, are twinning today, so you'll have to watch for that. What I wanted to go through our agenda today, first is a quick general overview. Some of you, this might be your third webinar that you're joining us on. You may have been talking to us uh, with on these items for the last four weeks or so. But we'll be talking about the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the EIDL. So that from here on out, it's going to be called EIDL. That's been out um, now for probably four and a half weeks. And it's also called the EIDL Emergency Advance. Many people know it by the up to $10,000. And then the big one today for us is the Paycheck Protection Program Loan, which we're going to call PPP from here on out. And then another big one for any of you who have existing SBA loans, I don't know if you've been notified or have seen, but the SBA is paying principal and interest 
on those loans for six months. So if you haven't seen anything on that and you have an existing loan, make sure you reach out on those items and get that benefit of those being paid for you. And again, we're at a time of information overload. It has finally, we feel on our COVID-19 team, slowed up a little bit for us, which has been nice to try to catch up. And then the fear-based decisions though, that's still spread through greatly. So we're hopeful that these webinars that we have are helping you with making decisions based on good information versus fear. So hopefully today we'll continue to help you with that. So first off is our EIDL versus the PPP programs. Which ones should you get? Which one is better for your business? And the EIDL is an application direct through the SBA. Many of you may have already done that process. Getting a loan up to $2 million maximum and then that $10,000 advance. I think when it first came out, everyone applied and thought, oh, I'm gonna get $10,000 within three days of applying, and that has not been the case. And we've actually now seen that that $10,000 advance is more of a $1,000 per employee type advance that'll be forgiven. And we haven't seen much for approvals on the loan, but we'll keep our eyes and ears open for that. And the EIDL loan, when you get it, not the advance part that's forgiven, but the loan itself, can be amortized up to 30 years. It's based on the borrower's ability to pay back. For businesses, that rate's 3.75%, and nonprofits, it's 2.75%. The items that you can use the two loans for need to be separate. They can not be the same uses. And what the EIDL said at first when it came out is for all expenses for the business, such as working capital items, that you aren't able to pay due to the COVID-19 economic uncertainty. On this loan, the owners have to put up a gear, personal guarantee for any loans over 200,000, and they're looking for collateral for any loans that are over 25,000. There's no forgiveness on this loan except for on the advance piece. And then the funding, as I said, has been super slow on both the loan and the advance. And there's been a lot that we have now seen rejection notices on them. So if you did apply, know that they are responding as they're able to, so just hold tight on that. And then today's program is mainly on the PPP. So for the PPP program, you would work with your banker. If you don't have a banker, we're seeing a lot of new lenders coming online this week that are going to be helping with that. And for the PPP loan for the businesses, it's two times the average payroll costs with a $10 million max. And we'll go into details today on what it is for the self-employed. Any amount that doesn't get forgiven under this loan ends up being amortized over two years at 1%. But what they're doing is deferring those payments for six months at this point. The monies from this loan can be used for payroll costs, interest on mortgages or other debt, rent or utilities. No guarantee or collaterals needed on this one, so it definitely is a benefit there. There is forgiveness as defined, which we'll go into later in the program by Chris. And then right, applications have been um, being accepted for both businesses and self-employed and for the self-employed since last Friday. So we're going to jump into the details on the PPP loan. And on this one, if any of you did get the EIDL, make sure you pay attention to when you got that loan and how you've used those funds. If you've already used some of those funds and they've been used for payroll, we just have to make sure that gets rolled into the PPP because again, we have to be using these two loans for different uses. The loans for the PPP are required to be funded by June 30th. So as we monitor and watch when should we be applying and what are the best uses, we always wanna make sure we're keeping that June 30th date in mind. But the good news is the forgivable amount and the allowable uses of the loans are going past June 30th. We weren't certain at first, but now we got that part figured out. So that was a blessing for sure. When you get the okay that the loan has been approved, they have to make the first disbursement on that loan no, letter, no later than 10 days from when you got that approval. So a lot of people were wondering if they could wait and delay getting the loan proceeds. It's now written that it's 10 days, but again, there's further work being done trying to see if they can delay it even further. So again, watch for that update from us on our website. And then this eight weeks that we were talking about is not gonna apply as much to the self-employed, so Chris will go into that. And the reason for the PPP loan is really for the uncertainty that your business is having. And what we wanna make sure is that you are documenting why it is you feel your business has been impacted and how those loan funds are going to be used just so that if they come back to you, you have that documented. For now the 
PPP loan for the self-employed. I know a lot of people have seen the, what are payroll costs and what goes into this. Well, now we're gonna talk through for your Schedule C and sole providers, how do we factor that? So the average monthly payroll cost for the self-employed individuals is your 2019 Schedule C. So the return, the tax return for the business is on a Schedule C where we record all of your income and expenses. So that net income number, you have to divide by 12. So that gets you your average monthly payroll cost. Unfortunately for the self-employed, we don't get to add in health insurance or retirement plan contributions. So that average monthly cost ends up being what we have to use. But note in number three, if you're over 100,000, we can only use 100,000 for that cost before we divide it by 12. And once we have that part done, we get to take the average payroll costs and divide it by, again, the, sorry, let me back up. The self-employed individual is the Schedule C again, which we divide by 12, plus any costs you have for your employees. So for the Schedule C self-employed that actually have employees that you're running payroll for, we then need to go back and calculate their average payroll costs. But again, no health insurance or retirement contributions are included for the owner, but we get to include them for any of the employees that you're covering. So again, this is a little bit tricky here if you have employees, so be sure to ask for further assistance with this if you need it. But again, those employees, if you're paying any over 100,000, you're going to be limited at the 100,000 for each employee. So in various different situations that we have documented here, we wanted to give you a few examples. What if you're a self-employed that and you were not in business during 2019, but you were and had started business by February 15th? We don't know. I know that's not a fun answer, but that's where we're, we're at at this point is we haven't seen any guidance. So we're hoping that we get guidance on that to come out soon. So for you guys, just to, you could sit tight and know that we'll follow up with you as soon as we know that. How about if I'm a self-employed Schedule C filer, but I had, I didn't end up with any income, but I had a loss on my 2019 Schedule C and maybe part of that was due to depreciation. Unfortunately, at this point, you are not eligible for the PPP loan since there's no net income there. And what about a self-employed person who has not yet filed their return? So we haven't pulled together the information, we're uncertain on getting that filed. Good news is the Schedule C just needs to be prepared and that gets submitted with your PPP application. So even though your full return hasn't been filed, we'll use your Schedule C. So definitely reach out, we'll be helping you get that prepared. And with that, we get to see Chris now. So Chris, can you join us for the partnerships? All right, so um, I mean, the, the topic today is the self-employed, but also the partnerships. We got guidance on both of those just yesterday. So let's talk about the partnerships here quickly. Um, partnerships have, have been able to apply since April 3rd. Um, unfortunately, we just got the guidance yesterday. So um, I know there are some partnerships that made assumptions um, and hopefully assumed the right, the, the right answer. And there are others that have delayed because they knew it was uncertain. Um, and so hopefully those partnerships can now go forward. Uh, they have published other guidance that said, if you apply based on what you knew at the time, um, that's still okay even if guidance comes out later and you sort of discover that your application um, maybe wasn't uh, following with the later guidance. So what did, what did the guidance say? It says that the partners in a partnership that are active, meaning they have self-employment income, either it's gonna be a self-employment income on their K-1 or, and or it's gonna be the guaranteed payments that show up on their K-1s that self-employment income gets included in the partnerships application for the PPP. So the individual shareholders, the partners in a partnership, there might be two 50-50 partners, those guaranteed payments go into the partnership application and those individuals are not permitted to submit their own personal PPP loan application. So that would be the double dipping. 
the partnership claims those guaranteed payments, the partnership claims the K-1 income. And generally that's what we had been telling clients to include those guaranteed payments. Um, but now we've finally gotten the guidance that says that is the right approach. So the guaranteed payments go in the partnership application and those partners do not, they are not eligible to apply on their own. Um, and so that, that's gonna include both those guaranteed payments and as we we're talking about, if there are no guaranteed payments, sometimes it's just ordinary income that flows out on the K-1s and that's self-employment to the individuals. So that would also count, even if it's not uh, sort of technically coded as a guaranteed payment. Just depends how the partnership is set up. Um, and to be clear, this would include uh, LLCs that are taxed as a partnership. LLCs can be taxed a number of different ways. Um, if there are multiple members in an LLC, the default would be to tax it as a partnership. Um, and so that would include, so when I say partnerships, we, we do mean the multi-member LLCs. And the single member LLCs, that's where you're gonna have a Schedule C and the self-employed rules are gonna apply to those folks. So let's talk about the debt forgiveness because I think this is really the, the biggest question that self-employed people had. It's, all right, so I, it sort of makes sense that the Schedule C income is used for the payroll costs on the front end uh, for the loan calculation. That was guidance that we expected it was good that they clarified it, but that was really what everyone's understanding was on the front end, even a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but the question was, once you get the PPP money, how do you spend it on payroll? What counts as, as spending it um, once you've received it? So they've, they've clarified, um, and it's really, I think, a favorable rule for taxpayers. So the question, what is the payroll cost for a Schedule C if you have no employees, it's just you, no employees, for the purposes of the loan forgiveness? And the answer they've given is a resounding, uh, absolutely nothing. You do not need to document this in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so there really is no payroll cost incurred during the eight-week period that you've received this PPP loan, which is tremendous. Um, answer for in individuals. And we will go through an example of this, uh, a detailed example, I think on the next slide. But uh, basically they're saying you get to take your 2019 Schedule C income, which is what you used to calculate the loan amount. And then you just get to say that it's covering eight weeks. So I take the Schedule C income, multiply by eight weeks, divided by 52. And that is the amount of the payroll cost for the purposes of the debt forgiveness. And it is just forgiven automatically. There's no documentation provided to the bank subsequently. Um, it's just an automatic calculation, which um, is, is obviously tremendously helpful uh, for Schedule C folks. So let's look at a detailed example here. If we've got a Schedule C with 150,000 of income, and zero employees. First off, the maximum is gonna be 100,000 that you can even consider. So the, the, the 50,000 on top just goes away. So now we're looking at 100,000 and we can divide by the 12 months and then our two and a half months, that gets us to our PPP loan amount. And so that's gonna be the $20,833. If you do not have employees, this is the absolute maximum that you can get. If your income was lower than 100,000, you'll get less. But if it's 100,000 or more on your Schedule C for 2019, your PPP loan is going to be exactly $20,833. So then how does the loan forgiveness work? The loan forgiveness is gonna be that same 100,000 times eight weeks, that's the eight week covered period, divided by 52, and that ends up being 15,385. So you don't have to do anything with this money and you're gonna automatically have 15,385 forgiven. 
if you're in the situation where you have a Schedule C with zero employees. They just count this 15,000 as the payroll cost to yourself, which is great. You can add to that, so you're not limited to just that. You can add to that the rent, utilities, the debt service, uh, the, the business mortgage, um, if you have those items. So those are items that you would be claiming on Schedule C as an expense. It's not gonna be your Schedule A expenses. It's just the Schedule C expenses, so that can add to it, um, certainly. And that can sort of make up the difference there because if you get 20,000 and they forgive 15, well, you got another five grand there. Um, that can either be spent on the rent, utilities, and the debt service for the business. And if it's not, because you, you maybe just don't have those items, um, then you're gonna end up with a loan that's over the two years at the 1% as Stacy was saying, those are the, gonna be the terms of these loans. So a, a bit more now on this debt forgiveness. So um, we've talked about the Schedule C that has no employees at all. If a Schedule C does have employees, it's sort of a combination of the example with no employees plus the webinar we did last week talking about businesses with employees and how do you measure uh, the payroll costs. So you really just get to add those two things together and that's how this is gonna work. So a Schedule C with employees is, is kind of like doing both computations at the same time and then adding them together. And so that's when you're gonna have to look at uh, the individual compensation of people and make sure it's not going down more than 25%. Uh, you're going to have to look at the FTE count, and all of those limitations are going to apply. You're just going to get to include that potentially the 100,000 Schedule C income for the owner, and that's how they're going to fit into the calculation. So it's sort of a hybrid of, of the method we talked about last week for the business owners and the self-employed method where you have no employees at all. So you, you just end up adding them uh, together and you get, um, I don't know if it's the best of both worlds, but it can make it the, the more complicated of, of both worlds uh, at, at times. So we wanted to highlight a few of these other considerations we think uh, were worth mentioning. If you don't have, and I know a lot of self-employed people don't exactly have a strong business banking relationship um, because you might not have any debt. Maybe you've just got a checking account for the business and, and that might be it. Um, if you either don't have a strong banking relationship or that banking relationship is one with one of the big, big banks, that is not generally working out very well for self-employed folks. So um, there's a few other lenders coming online. So Square, PayPal, and Intuit. So like if you're using QuickBooks, that's into it. Um, those are coming online as lenders. So it's going beyond the traditional bank um, because we know clients have been struggling, struggling mightily to deal with the Wells Fargo's, the US banks, the Bank of America's, the Chase, those kinds of banks have made it very difficult, um, especially for the very small lenders and the self-employed Schedule C folks uh, without a bunch of employees, those are going to be smaller loans. And I think you're better, potentially better served at one of those sort of online financial places like the Square or PayPal, or going to a smaller community bank. Um, we found them to be a little better to work with uh, clients and, and just to help out. So um, I would I would keep looking around because I know some of the, the big banks have, have basically just said, we don't have time for this. We're not gonna help uh, some of these people. So uh, I would just keep, keep looking around. There are people out there that will do these deals and there are more coming online every day. And these, these financial uh, technology firms are more geared towards the self-employed. We wanna be sure that we're setting up a separate bank account for these PPP funds. Um, so that we can track how we're spending the money on the rent and the utilities. Um, 
it seems that you really don't need to document the the eight weeks to yourself, but I would still probably put that in the separate bank account and then take a distribution of it uh, to, to the individual. Um, I still think that's a good idea, um, but certainly tracking those other expenses through there. And absolutely, if you have employees, um, that's the way to run all of the payroll for them through that separate account. Um, we do think there is additional funding that's gonna happen for these PPP loans. You may have heard there, they think they're about to run out of money. Um, there's another 250 billion that's sort of teed up in Congress. Uh, so we really do not anticipate them letting this run out of money right now, uh, because realistically, all the self-employed people haven't even applied yet, because uh, their application just came out the other day and there was no guidance. So I know there's a lot of self-employed people who who haven't yet gotten in the queue. Um, so we really don't expect this to, to totally be running out of money uh, anytime soon. But I would, I would certainly, now that we have the guidance out, I would be looking at um, what's your strategy and when is it that you, you wanna be applying for this. Uh, a few other uh, comments on, on just some random things here. There are federal law changes to the unemployment um, and, it, and it can allow for self-employed individuals to get unemployment benefits. And it is not specifically addressed, but we, we do think that if you get a PPP loan, that income, that source of, of income needs to be reported on your unemployment. So you're probably not gonna be eligible for unemployment if you are receiving the PPP loan. Um, there's nothing specific on that, and it's a federal rule which is then running through all of the states because they're the ones that administer the unemployment. Uh, but what we would say is um, it, it seems unlikely you can double dip and do both of those. I do think, however, if your business uh, really declined, you could do the PPP and then for the eight weeks and potentially when the eight weeks is up, that's when you could potentially go back and apply for the unemployment if your, your self-employment income is, is dramatically reduced. Uh, statutory employees, uh, that's sort of a nuanced thing. They get W-2s, so we think that those should be included in the PPP loans of the employer. A statutory employee does file a Schedule C, but they do not pay self-employment tax. And so it does not appear that a statutory employee would be allowed to file their own PPP application. And then I would say there's still some technicalities, still some issues with forgiveness um, that are still unknown. I know there's some timing things that they're still working on. So even for a self-employed person, I still would recommend keeping that separate bank account, keeping records as, as good as you can. Um, about what you're spending the money on. It's certainly a lot more flexible for self-employed people who do not have employees, um, but that doesn't mean you should go out and buy a Lamborghini the day after you get your PPP money. I don't know that that's uh, necessarily gonna look good. Um, they're not specifically asking for documentation, but that doesn't mean you want to be recklessly spending the PPP money. So. Certainly for that eight week time period, I would still be keeping as good a records as you can and being judicious with the money because they intend for this to be sort of an income replacement uh, for the, the owners of the Schedule Cs. Uh, so certainly keep that in mind and keep the, the intent in mind. So as Stacy said, we're, we're thinking an impact statement for clients would be helpful when you're applying just to document and sort of memorialize for your own records what it is that's going through your mind right now uh, with all of the uncertainty with your business, just to be sure that uh, on the back end you're, you're covered. Because it might be harder to, to document some of those things uh, four months from now if, if they do request to see some records. So um, I think that's about it. Let's uh, let's see if Nick has any questions. 
Thank you, Chris. And yes, there's been quite a few questions. Thank you all for doing that and for using the upvote. That does help me quite a bit to kind of sort through all of these and make sure we're getting to the ones that everybody wants to know. Uh, Chris, actually, if you could hop back on, I think we're gonna have two questions probably that will be right in your wheelhouse. All right. uh, as, all right, how does an independent contractor, this one is specific to their industry of in a hair salon, but this works for anybody really. What's our first step? If we just don't even know, what do we go do? So an independent contractor, whether it's a hair salon or a consultant or anything else, um, anybody that files a Schedule C uh, would be treated the same way for this purpose. Um, you should look at filling out your 2019 Schedule C. That has to be done. So that's part of the application process. Um, the application is available on the SBA website. I believe we have a link to it on our website. The application itself is not complicated. Um, you, you probably don't need any help filling out the actual application. Uh, gathering the documents um, can be a little bit more work, but if you don't have any employees, the documents is going to consist of entirely your 2019 Schedule C. Uh, so if you've already filed your return, you've already got it, that's great. If you haven't filed your return yet for any reason, uh, you just need to have the Schedule C part done. You don't need to file the rest of your return. You just need the Schedule C part done. And then you got to go find a bank that wants to do this. So whether that's um, a PayPal or Square or something like that, or your local community bank, that's the next step. Because you take that application you take that Schedule C and you submit them to the bank. And that's how, that's how you get the ball rolling on this. Perfect. And I did also hear from a few different clients that a company called Lendio has successfully processed some of these smaller ones, L-E-N-D-I-O. And they are a partner of uh, Heartland Payment Systems, uh, which is a huge payroll processor and credit card processor. Um, I know them well because of the restaurant and brewery space. But sort of piggybacking that, because Chris is now the salon expert and has been knowing them all around the country. Uh, and again, this still works for any company, really, is if I'm the owner and I have mostly independent contractors, so in this case, they're booth renters, what do I do uh, if I am the only one and I don't, I'm not on a salary? But also, what if I have both and it's still a Schedule C? Yeah, so if you have... Anyone who's renting a booth, they are self-employed. They need to get their own PPP loan. Um, if you want to help them out, you can tell them to watch the recording of this webinar. Um, but the people who rent from you, they're totally on their own. Um, and there's really nothing you can do for those folks. Um, but for the employees that you do have, and depending on how your business is set up, you might be an employee of that business. So you might have an S corp where you have a few employees and you might be among the employees. Um, that's where the rules from last week would apply where it's gonna be based on the payroll costs and you can definitely apply for the PPP. Um, the only thing I would caution for businesses that are closed is you wanna consider the timing because if you get the PPP money, but you're still required to be closed, um, I'm not really sure how useful that is uh, because paying people to do absolutely no work is, is not really to the advantage of the employer. Um, so I'd wanna be careful about when you bring people back and just be sure you have a strategy around that. Um, but the employer is gonna qualify for a PPP based on their employees. And then the independent contractors, which is the people renting the booth, they are on their own and they need to do their own PPP applications. Awesome. Thank you. It's been forever since we've seen Stacy, and I know she's itching to get back out here in front of people. Hey, Stacy. <laughs> um, quick, a couple quick ones for you. Uh, what are, what's the dollar restrictions related to these loans? So the, that 100,000 for the self-employed is the number. So let's say your Schedule C is 280,000. Unfortunately, you have to cap that at the 100,000 and do the calculation based on that number. So 
that is our maximum amount that we can get for the PPP on one person. Businesses. And that's after all your expenses, right? Not your after top After all, yep, that's our net. So the net number is on the bottom of your Schedule C net profit. And so we'll use. anybody who made 100,000 or more as their net profit will get a maximum, or assuming they don't have employees, of 21,000 roughly. Yeah, 20,833 actually. Thank I've done a you. bunch of them today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, a couple other ones that are sort of just related to housekeeping items is how important is it to maintain a separate PPP bank account? I, what we like and have been doing now since we started this a few, three weeks ago or so, is have, when you apply for that loan with the bank, also ask them to open a separate bank account. What they're doing then is putting your proceeds into that account. We're not having you pay your bills directly out of that account. Obviously you won't have checks and things like that. But what it'll allow us to do is transfer those um, uses, permitted uses that we're using the funds for into your operating account. For the self-employed, it's a little bit tougher because as far as we know, it's forgiven based on 2019 numbers. So it's just as you take draws, you'd put money from the PPP um, account into your operating account and then take your draw that way. Awesome. Um, I think I will have Chris come back for a couple. Um, first one for you, Chris, is I have um, one of our participants, they have vacation rentals in a single member LLC. And I don't want you to get too technical on passive and all that other fun stuff I know you're going to want to do, but I'm looking to apply, apply for the PPP. How do you calculate average monthly payroll? Or doesn't even, does it even matter that their vacation rentals could we be in any? Um, so any Schedule C with positive net income can get this. Uh, depending on what kind of vacation rentals you have, those might be Schedule E's. And so if it's a Schedule E, you do not get a PPP loan. Hmm. If it is a Schedule C, and it could be, um, it's just gonna be based on the very bottom I believe it's line 31 of the Schedule C. You're just going to take Schedule C income, divide by 12, and that's your that's your average monthly payroll cost. Perfect. So if I bought a big truck at the end of the year to try to hit my Schedule C income down, that's not going to help me out on the PPP. Is that right? That's correct. So if you took a bunch of depreciation on, on that truck in December, that was great tax planning at the time. And now you have a loss or you have zero income, you are not gonna get a PPP. All right, um, if say we do get the PPP money, uh, do I have to use every penny within eight weeks? And when does that eight weeks start? So first the eight weeks starts the day you get the first uh, deposit of the money. Uh, that part is very clear. You may or may not get the full deposit the first day, uh, we've had some clients that did and others will get it over a series of, of maybe a couple weeks even. Um, so the eight weeks starts the day you get the first deposit. Um, do you need to spend the money during the eight weeks? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so if you have no employees, you actually don't even need to spend the money. Um, going back to, to the example of 100,000 of income, you're gonna get a PPP of, of like 20 grand. They're gonna forgive 15, whether you spend the money or not. Uh, so you don't even need to spend that money. I probably would transfer it to your personal account so that it looks like um, you are replacing your personal income, but there's actually no requirement for you to spend that money. During that eight weeks, that's when you have the ability to spend the money on the rent, the utilities, and the, and the uh, potentially other payroll costs if you have the employees. So if you have the employees, they're gonna look at the loan forgiveness during that eight weeks. And if, for example, you spend maybe 80% of the money and the other 20% you don't because you don't have a lot of rent and utilities or, maybe an employee or two leaves or doesn't come back or something, uh, that's okay. That's where that remainder is gonna roll into the loan. And there can be some other limitations on the amount forgiven, but any amount that is not spent is okay. 
Um, you do need to spend it on payroll sometime if you have the employees, but uh, it's okay if you don't spend the money. It's just that that's going to roll into the loan. They're not going to forgive it if you don't actually spend it. Great. And can you talk about, you previously mentioned about potentially holding off on applying for the PPP. Could you talk about why you would want to do that? Yeah. So we've run through this with a number of clients where um, if they're closed to the public, like a restaurant or a salon or like a gym or something like that, where they are totally closed, their revenue is zero they really don't have a lot of or any incentive to bring back the employees. So we've looked at a strategy where you might delay applying for the PPP until you are a little more certain that you're going to be able to reopen. Uh, I mean, I hope we can all reopen soon, but it's certainly unknown. I know here in Minnesota, uh, the stay at home order goes through like the middle of May and that's different everywhere and it's going to be different for different types of businesses but if you look at if i got a ppp loan on april 15th my eight weeks starts and so it's going to be april 15th through about june 15th and if i'm not allowed to reopen my store my retail store until june 1st then i'm only going to have like two weeks of payroll cost so i would be better off waiting and doing the PPP loan maybe May 20th, and then I reopen June 1st, that kind of a time frame, and then maybe I'm gonna have six or seven weeks of payroll, so I'll have way more costs that are covered, which means way more things are gonna be forgiven. So I think that's, that's the strategy, but we are aware of um, issues where, where businesses have already gotten the PPP money, um, and it's certainly a big problem if they're closed. You don't really want to pay people to just sit at home and do absolutely nothing. Um, so we think they're, they're, we know of the AICPA is pushing for some better guidance on those to maybe give them a little more flexibility. But until that comes out, I would, I would personally look very carefully at delaying until you're a little more certain that you can be open and employees can be doing things that that actually generate revenue to pay for themselves. Great. Thank you for answering that. Uh, Stacy. if I could have you get back on, I think I have a couple compound questions or they're all kind of tied together. Uh, there seems to be, and, and there always is a lot of confusion about the PPP loan, the EIDL and unemployment. Does one affect your ability to take the other uh, if you take one, are you exempted from the other two? Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? I can. So the EIDL and the PPP are the two you know, programs that came out that are related to loans. Obviously the PPP, we try to get forgiven. Again, we have to look at what are the purposes of each of them. If you're gonna apply for both, you just need to make sure that the PPP is payroll only and the EIDL would be for working capital for your business. You could be paying your utilities out of that or your rent, but don't mix the two funds. If you're gonna mix the two funds, then you're, you're using those loans incorrectly. And then when we talk about the unemployment side, the EIDL is really for keeping the business um, expenses covered when you are not open for business. So that one doesn't directly affect unemployment. The PPP is the Paycheck Protection Program. So as a self-employed, if you're applying for and getting the PPP, you are creating a paycheck for yourself. So therefore, on unemployment, we do believe you're going to have to say that then you're getting paid for that eight-week period. So you really want to look at what is the amount you can get for your PPP and what amount could you be getting on unemployment. So you kind of got to look at both sides of it to make sure you've got the uh, big picture figured out and are getting what is going to be most beneficial for you. Great. Thanks. Um, one other one sort of related to this is if I've already applied for the PPP, but I haven't heard anything, should I apply with someone else? Should I apply with one of the smaller ones that we mentioned or should I stick it out? What are your That's thoughts? A great question. So the way the PPP is working, you guys, is it's going to be tied to, as a sole proprietor, you might be using your social security number or you may have an EIN or an employer identification number. 
once you've submitted with a bank, they are going to be sending all your stuff into the SBA based on that ID number. If you go somewhere else and again, submit your information and they apply and it hits the SBA with the same EIN or social security number, that could kick out your loan and you may not be able to get the PPP at all. So unfortunately, my answer is stick with where you have already applied to make sure you don't hurt yourself in the long run. Great. And so then two questions around timing is how long have we seen, does it take for us to get the money after being applied for at the PPP, for the PPP? The fastest I had, you guys, I had an um, application that went in on Wednesday morning last week and we got the money Friday afternoon. So it was a two day turn is the fastest I have. I think I'd say on average, I would give it seven to 10 days. It's kind Seems of a good fair. average, yeah. I agree. And uh, somebody had a question on that June 30th date. Uh, is the June 30th date for the PPP extended? And when is it extended through? Yeah, thank you. I saw that and said I wanted to answer that live because that was on one of my slides. The application, so far, it, we can only apply up through that June 30th date. So, and what I was trying to say is that eight week period after you're funded, we were kind of afraid the way the act read is that we only had up till June 30th to use all the funds. It is just the use of the funds for that eight week time span that goes beyond June 30th. Will that date get expanded? I mean, it's all, a, again, that's a guessing game too. We'll watch for guidance on that to come out based on where the economy's at and how quickly we can come out of this and turn around. Great, and I think I had somebody on here who might be a accountant or they're an actuary or something because this is a great question but could we just apply for the 15385 that we know is forgivable versus the whole 20833 you you absolutely can you guys I love that. that that's a strategy piece right so you're putting together what's the maximum amount i can get on the front end and what amount can i use up to be forgiven and if you don't have any you know a lease agreement that's in your LL, you know, single member LLC's name or in your personal name, so you can't use those funds for rent and you don't really have any utilities per se that you're under contract for, then yes, that is just fine to ask for less on that loan. So then you know you're going to have the full amount forgiven. I would say though, because we don't have guidance, I would not do that because this is all so new. We're kind of hoping that it just gets pushed through and says, never mind, we didn't do our calculation right, just keep the whole 20800 so yeah, I'd, could, I'd just say, sit there. yes, because you can pay it back at any time, you guys, there's no prepayment no penalty. penalty on this PPP. So I would, I love your thought process. The strategy is great, but take it all to begin with. You can nice. always pay it back at the end. So uh, Chris, if I could have you come back, I saw a question with the word tax in it. So I, I didn't even read the rest. I just thought <laughs> I'd call you back right away because it's been far too long since we talked about a tax return. Um, is the forgiveness taxable? No. All right. Easy. Done. So it is, no part it of it. It is not. Um, the, the loan forgiveness is not taxable and they still let you deduct the expenses that you paid with it. So for a, a self-employed with no employees, that doesn't really mean anything. But if you have employees uh, and you're getting the PPP money in order to pay them, the debt forgiveness is not taxable and you still get to deduct all of the wages and the rent and the utilities and everything else. So it's, it's a heck of a good deal. That's awesome. So I have two very similar questions that I'll kind of try to morph together is, uh, I'm currently in a situation where maybe I'm not completely shut down, but my income has been significantly reduced. Should I still apply for any of these loans? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, We'll cut right to the chase. Yes, um, the PPP application has certifications um, that your business is being impacted, but it does not require that your business is totally shut down. It does not require that your revenue has, has reduced a certain amount. Um, so if you have uncertainty in terms of having future income or you think your income is going to be down in the future or you think you're going to have a hard time collecting from the people you've already done work for um, i think that that is certainly enough uncertainty uh, to allow you to apply for the ppp 
Great. Um, uh, we have a participant that actually, they got rejected by U.S. Bank, which we've heard uh, U.S. Bank yeah. is definitely having some issues right now with this loan. They can't take multi-member applications and a whole host of other things. But uh, in that case, or any bank, whatever, if we got rejected for a non, for a wrong reason, can I go and apply somewhere else? Yeah, I, I would. Yeah. Um, yeah, we know U.S. Bank has had, and Wells Fargo, holy cow, they've both had... <laughs> some serious troubles uh, with these things. Um, so if they've rejected you, then your application is really not sitting with the SBA and then you would be okay um, to go apply somewhere else. What Stacy was talking about earlier is you don't want two applications to actually make it to the SBA. Yeah. Because then they'll both get bounced and you'll, you'll presumably be ineligible for either. Yeah, um, don't race your it, bankers. If U.S. Bank said, no, nah, we're not going to submit this, um, go somewhere else that will submit it. Yeah. Um, great question on the partners and the partnership. Can partners who receive their comp as non-guaranteed payments, so most likely just through draws, be included in the payroll expense calculation? Yes, if it's self-employment income. So Great. this is where it, it's going to look at, they have to be active partners. That's how they get the self-employment income in the first place. So um, different partnerships are set up different ways. Uh, but if there is self-employment income on that K-1, that is what will go into the PPP calculation for the partnership. Hmm. And if it is ordinary income without any self-employment, then the K-1 income, those draws are not going to count uh, towards any of the PPP calculations. Okay, great. Um, for self-employed people, we've talked a lot about that 75% that we are pretty sure is just going to be auto forgiven, I guess, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. The other 25, the uh, remaining 25%, uh, there's still restrictions around how to use that correctly? Yes. So that's where even a separate bank account is still a good idea. Um, that other 25% can be used on the rent, utilities, um, interest on debt, but it's got to be stuff that would have been claimed on a Schedule C. Hmm. Um, so maybe a Schedule C doesn't have any rent um, or utilities that would count. Um, I think that's certainly possible. Um, but if they do have the rent and the utilities and the interest on debt that was incurred prior to February, um, that can be used towards the, the other 25% to get the rest of that forgiven. Great. And I know here's a good question we had a little discussion on internally is I didn't file a Schedule C, but I did receive a 1099. And I'm hoping this isn't that they ignored the 1099. I'm assuming <laughs> this is they listed it as other income. Am I allowed or do I have anything eligible to apply for the PPP? No. I think the answer is no. Um, they've, they've made it pretty clear that this is based on the Schedule C income. And if you just got um, one random 1099 from, from something uh, and you did not put it on a Schedule C, you're, you're basically saying that I'm not operating a trade or business hmm. because you didn't put it on a Schedule C. And so they're saying, well, the PPP loans are only good for people who are operating a trader business. Um, so if it's not on a Schedule C, it doesn't count. All right, thank you, Chris. I would, say, oh. I would say there's one potential exception to that, which is farms. There can be Schedule F farms that have self-employment income. Um, and so it's, they've said nothing about the farms. Uh, I, I do think a Schedule F with self-employment income could count, but otherwise, those are the only two ways to get Thank this. you. Of course, you have an asterisk. All tax people have an asterisk by everything they say. Uh, Stacy, if I could have you come back. Um, I have a couple uh, just really quick fire ones, really, is uh, my bank is saying I shouldn't or don't need to have a separate bank account open. Uh, should I still, or what are your thoughts? I know I kind of already asked this, but I just like that the bank was telling them they didn't need I, it. Why yeah, not? your your bank says no. They're the ones who have to stand, you know, be the ones to turn in your forgiveness part of it. So, oh. I I would say if they, it sounds like they don't want to do the work to open an account for you, but I would ask one more time. Say I watched yeah. a webinar and I was told it was best to keep the funds separate, 
and just give it one more shot. Yeah, and it's to help both of you, really. It's the person receiving it and the banker, uh, which actually kind of leads into another question is, how is this forgiveness happening uh, for the 25% in this instance? Do Is this a tax form I'm sending in or do we know much about that yet? Okay, so what Nick is saying, I don't think we even said in this one, but with the initial PPP loan, it came out that 75% of that loan proceed amount can be for payroll and then they let that 20, 25% of that be used for the rent or mortgage interest or the utilities that you're spending above and beyond those payroll costs. So what you need to do is for the rent, you need to have a lease agreement. So you wanna save that and have that prepared to turn in. And then for your utilities, you wanna keep those invoices to be able to turn those in as for the forgiveness at the end of the eight week period. Great. And are we turning that into the IRS? That goes to your banker. So the okay. bank then has to calculate on the back end what the forgiveness piece is so that they know what amount does the SBA reimburse them to the bank for the funds that you've used or what amount needs to go on to a loan that gets set up for you that's deferred with payments over six months, but then amortized at two years at 1%. Great. And kind of going into it, a similar question off of that is if I ended up not spending all my PPP funds, can I pay it back assuming it's still just sitting there? Yes. So that's the, again, where I said there's no prepayment penalty. So you definitely don't have to turn that into a loan. It can go back to the bank and it just offsets that loan to zero dollars and forgives the amount that you did use for forgiveness purposes. Great. And uh, lots of questions. And I don't know that we even know this, uh, as a Schedule C owner, do I apply under the business name with the LLC after it? Do I apply as my DBA or do I apply in my personal name? I got a lot of those in here, I think. Okay, so what I, you guys, if you have the LLC name with an EIN, I mean, that's what you're filing your Schedule C as, I would file as that. But let's say you did, you personally prepared your own tax return and your Schedule C has your name on it, then I would tie it to what the Schedule C says Chris you can jump in here if you disagree but they're going to be the only backup you're giving them is that schedule c so however you have titled that that's how i would apply for the loan perfect and a few different questions from people that have either short years or possibly seasonal and i don't know that we would have time that's probably a whole nother webinar but say i just bought my business in november last year or even say february of this year okay is there anything that we can apply for? Is there uh, any thoughts on that company? Sure. So on your the November, December timeframe of purchasing that business, you'll have a Schedule C, which will be very short. And it'll be, did you end up having net income in those two months? Then yes, the PPP will work out for you. For those that have just started in the beginning of this year, then we don't know yet. We're waiting on guidance. So I'd say sit tight. And then I saw there was one that said I was used to be under my personal name and then I got the LLC set up, which is great. Yeah. Congratulations, protect yourself legally. I like that a lot. I would honestly do it under your personal name since your 2019 Schedule C does not have the LLC on it. Very smart. Um, do we know if, or and actually I believe we do, are owner's credit scores being considered in any of this? And, or is there collateral they're looking for? So the credit score, I know U.S. Bank is for sure. That it specifically states on the application that they will be looking at credit scores. I, the small community banks I've worked with, I haven't seen any of them asking for that. So it, it's going to be a bank by bank. I think it's a fair question to ask up front if they're going to be doing that. And what was the second part of that, Nick? Oh, I forgot. I was already reading the next question. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> I, I spaced out completely right no, after no, I read no. it. Um, I was just moving on to, as a sole proprietor, can you get the EIDL advance and what would it be a thousand dollars? So you can apply you guys, but the funds are very, very much close to running out on that. I don't, I, I would apply because all you can get is no. And that application is on the SBA.gov website. Super simple. I'd say it'll take you 10 minutes. Same thing, you don't really need us to assist with that. It's gonna ask for your income and expenses. I would honestly use your Schedule C from 2019 for that. So again, always better to try and get a no than to not try at all. 
Great, and um, a few different people are asking for earlier slides that we had and just know this will be up on our website within 24 hours and so will the slide deck. So please uh, check our website right when you get onto the main page, it's right at the top and it's right at the bottom, the COVID-19 resource hub. Uh, we have a lot of great information in there. All of our old webinars are there and this one will be up very shortly. Um, I think I'm gonna have to unfortunately leave the 45 questions open. And uh, if you do work with someone here, please reach out. We're very happy to help. We have an awesome dedicated team to this CARES Act and to the new phases coming up, which we didn't even mention, uh, not that we know much about them, but we are staying on top of this as much as we can and it's changing twice a day as it seemed for a while. So please reach out. We're very happy to help and talk about these questions specifically. Uh, some of these are very uh, specific just for your business. So we'd love to handle them offline, uh, but please reach out. Uh, all of our contact information is right there. And it, it is technically April 15th. So we're all kind of celebrating today, <laughs> uh, but we'll be back to normal in no time. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Anything thank you. you. And I just thank everyone for taking the time. I know that, again, a stressful time for all of us. But we didn't talk a lot about strategy in here, but the questions on PPP, EIDL, unemployment are very, very important for the, our self-employed. So don't kind of just run off and apply for things without reaching out to those trusted advisors that you have around you to make sure we're getting you the best benefit we can at this time where your income virtually is gone. Yeah. Chris? Uh, no, yeah. No cat appearance? No, the, the cat uh, fell asleep, I guess. Good job. So Cornelius has not made his appearance yet today. Um, but with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll sign off. And as, and as we've said, we'll put this on the website within 24 hours, including the slide deck and this full recording. Um, so you can enjoy it for, for weeks and weeks to come. <laughs> share, it, share it with all your friends. Uh, Let them know how plug. much fun you had today. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank bye. you, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.